So many times over the years, we as fans have gone, well, that wrestler is never coming back. Be it the way they left a the company or the fact they were forced out due to injury, everything is telling us that they're done. This is wrestling, though. Somehow the unthinkable keeps happening. Regardless how they do return, the joy is always in the fact they did come back at all. But just for fun, I'm Sam from What Culture. Please hit that subscribe button. And here's every impossible return ranked from worst to best. Number 11, Bret Hart. Let me make this very clear. Bret Hart is number one on my all-time list and for me is the best. Seeing him get his due over the last few years has been wonderful. When he did leave the then WWF in 1997 after the Montreal Screwjob though, come on now. Not only did no fan think he was ever coming back, Hart would tell you this constantly. He got done over by Vincent Kennedy McMahon, so that was that. As already mentioned, you never say never, and in 2010, it was announced that the Hitman was going to be on Raw. I remember being stunned by this because I could not believe it. And I'm still a little mad that he didn't get a bigger reaction. People should have lost their minds. It, of course, tied into an angle with McMahon, and this is when things fell down a little bit. We had the story all ready to go in real life, but for some reason we added weird twists to it, such as a car accident. It didn't make any sense. Hearing Brett talk about his WrestleMania 26 match will put it into context as he needed that after the Survivor Series and the awful stroke he suffered. But this was never going to be able to live up to expectations. Sadly, Hart was too hurt. WWE didn't really get what they had. as ever. Number 10, Shawn Michaels. I don't get all this he ruined his legacy nonsense. Did he? Or can we just ignore the part we didn't like and pretend it never happened? Yes, yes, we can. This is the best way to treat Shawn Michaels' comeback in 2018 as a massive paycheck was enough to convince the heartbreak kid it was worth doing one more match and he was right. Would any of us have turned down this much money? No, we wouldn't have. That's not to say it worked out, because it didn't at all. It was like the wrestling powers in the sky decided this tag bout between him and Triple H versus the Brothers of Destruction had to be cursed. I mean, I started looking around for Danhausen. Because the game tore his pet, Kane's mask fell off, The Undertaker was not at 100%, and Sean at one point fell on his head. It was terrifying. Don't think these four didn't know this afterwards either. Just look at Michaels' face when all was said and done, or listen to his interviews. He knew, and I'm sure now he just laughs his ass off. That's the healthy way to do it. This still doesn't mean it was a successful comeback, though. It most definitely wasn't. Number 9, Shane McMahon. I don't think anybody thought Shane McMahon was about to make his return to Raw in early 2016. Or at least I didn't. I remember hearing, here comes a money hit, and genuinely being stunned. That was quite the moment. He got a mega pop as well, which made this feel like a massive deal when we learned that he would be facing The Undertaker at WrestleMania 33, with the contents of a lockbox being the focus. <laughs> this was also true, as even though he lost to the dead man, Shane was still made the GM of Raw, making this whole thing pointless, but look. He took that crazy bump off the top of the cell, he then had a really good match with AJ Styles, and got involved with some other nonsense. The less said about the Braun Strowman stuff, the better. But it was decent, all things considered. Aside from the times, McMahon was allowed to book himself as on par with some of the best wrestlers in the world. We all know the deal, though. Let's just accept it for what it is. Number 8, Goldberg. So this one is just gonna divide the audience. I have enjoyed a lot of Goldberg's performances since he did surprisingly come back in 2016, and his series with Brock Lesnar was awesome. Proper big men hitting man meat stuff. Outside of that, however, the jury is out. We all remember the stuff with The Fiend, we did not need that match with The Undertaker, but there were bright spots with Bobby Lashley and Dolph Ziggler. It's proper up and down stuff. The true shocker was that we got here to begin with. Bill had left WWE in 2004 with no interest in ever working with Vincent Man again, and yet here we were. And do you want to know what clicked second time around? Because WWE used Goldberg as Goldberg. No silly wigs, no 10 minute plus matches, just the old steam train that underlines why he reached the heights he did. I would assume he's not done either, and as long as we keep him away from the world title and let younger talent beat him, cool, go nuts. Although if you are worried this may not be the plan, and instead Vince sees this as a in case of emergency smash bill, yeah I get it. Number 7, Edge. This one was truly surreal. When Edge left in 2011, he was forced to because of his neck. He was so badly injured, doctors told him one bad bump could kill him. He had no choice to walk away, even as world heavyweight champion, and I can't even imagine it. Adam Copeland then went and did pretty damn well as an actor before his awesome comeback in 2020. He did it right by returning in the Royal Rumble, and seriously, I could watch that every day. It is emotion personified.
side. Sadly, the pandemic then slowed down his feud with Randy Orton, which was totally finished off after he suffered a tricep injury. But when he rehabbed that, we had all that good stuff with Seth Rollins. It was fantastic. His Mania 37 main event is also far better than people give it credit for. And at the moment, he's gone full bad guy alongside Damian Priest and loves sitting in big chairs. This is a bit strange, but it's early days, and if anybody can make it work, it's Edge. I don't really care, to be honest with you, though. Even if he had just been in the Rumble and then left again, it would still be one of the best moments ever. Number six, Christian Cage. And it is the same for his best friend and once brother, Christian. WWE, as ever, had no idea of his quality as his Rumble return was treated as slight shock as opposed to, oh my gosh, this is likely why Mr. Cage decided to go to AEW ever since he has been smashing it. Do not forget that Christian was forced into retirement due to concussion issues and therefore never expected to compete again. And yet here he was winning the Impact World title from none other than Kenny Omega. This is awesome. From there, he's proved once again that he is one of the most underappreciated workers in history, and his relationship with the Jurassic Express has been great. Not only has it slotted Christian in and amongst the AEW roster, but his experience is second to none for Jungle Boy to learn from. As of me talking, it seems likely he will turn heel and maybe even feud with Jungly Jim, which will help all of this even more. And honestly, any promotion on the planet should want Christian. He brings so much to the table. I know, I know, some people weren't happy with how Tony can't introduced him but please do remember he's a promoter his job is to promote number five stone cold steve austin i was there live and i still don't believe it i didn't believe it when the rumor started i didn't believe it when kevin owens began calling him out i didn't believe it sat in my seat at wrestlemania only when the glass broke on that saturday night did i think it was possible and then my word just excellent be it night one when he had an awesome brawl with ko or night two where we repeated all the best moments from a classic monday night raw seeing the rattlesnake say goodbye properly in texas was everything you'd want it to be, especially because it was never meant to happen. Austin was so banged up when he retired in 2003, even he knew that was likely it. And while I'm sure money was a motivating factor, this was the absolute best, so who gives a flub? I'm not sure anybody else could have done this in the way that the bionic redneck did at 58 years old. And I will finish this off by saying, it really was special. And before Sting, Sting was done. After Seth Rollins buckle bombed him and essentially broke his neck, he stepped away from the ring, got inducted into the Hall of Fame and seemingly retired. And sure, he teased a comeback during his speech, but nobody believed it. It was over. Because wrestling is mad though, not only did he surprise us all by arriving at AEW, but at the age of 60 plus, started taking bumps and falls that no elderly gentleman should be doing, let alone someone who'd been told he wasn't in the best shape. Sting keeps doing this too, and somehow, this is getting better and better. There used to be this stupid argument that he wasn't an old-timer, and now that has definitely been thrown out the window, and his relationship with Darby Allen has helped both guys move forward. He's also treated with a crazy amount of respect that he's earned, and it helps his aura, and I'll never understand how he's doing it. The icon is exactly that, and who knows how much longer he wants to go on. To get to 70 at this rate, and I shall support him every step of the way, this has been legendary. Number three, Brock Lesnar. I mean, how? Brock Lesnar was at the top of the food chain in the early 2000s when he went to Vincent Mann and told him he was done he went home. I think we forget how impactful this was because Brock was the man then and within a space of the year had been given everything. I mean, this was our new star and now he wasn't there anymore. It resulted in lawsuits and less than complimentary words from both sides. And after Lesnar had become the king in UFC, it felt like he had found his new line of work, but we should have known. Because with his stock higher than ever and a businessman at his heart, Brock and McMahon did come to terms on an agreement that saw the beast return to Raw the night after WrestleMania 28. Just go and watch the fans to see the surprise in their eyes and ever since he has been a monster. WWE felt the need to punish him at first because he dared to leave, so he had to lose to John Cena and Triple H. But after that, it has been a crazy run. Not only has he become pro wrestling's final boss, but he was also given the honor and the rub of defeating the Undertaker's WrestleMania streak. You can argue that till the cows come home and maybe he didn't need it. Flub me, it gave him some serious momentum. Today, Brock has done so much, he has to be in the best ever category, and I mean it, Lesnar is awesome. Number two, Brian Danielson. Once again, how did this happen? Just go and watch the emotional speech the then Daniel Bryan gave the WWE fans in 2015. You won't get through it without cutting some onions. It is the realest thing in the world. That man was devastated. This made sense too, as no one loved the art and core of wrestling more than Bryan. So when it was taken away from him due to concussion problems, everybody's heart broke. It didn't seem fair. And then, from nowhere, a rumor started in 2018 that the leader of the Yes movement had found a way to get cleared, and then bang, it was announced for SmackDown 
when all of this rocked. From there, he has proved he is one of the best ever too, from the planet's WWE champion to having five-star matches constantly to everything he's done in AEW. Seriously, go and find something bad that he's done. It doesn't exist. There's a reason William Regal goes to town with him so much because Danielson is ridiculously good, and all this after a massive absence in the middle where he was used as a general manager. It also feels like he's on the runner of his life right now, which is saying something, and when he does hang up his boots for good, no one will ever come close, especially because he was never meant to be back in the ring anyway. Just the best story. Number one, CM Punk. I was such a person that felt like CM Punk would never come back to wrestling, because why would he? He had a more than successful post-career, and WWE was the only game in town. All you need to do is listen to Punk's story to understand why he wouldn't want that in his life. It broke him. When AEW became a thing, though, chatter started again, but even then, this was soon thrown out the window as it sounded like Punk and the EVPs were not on the same page. And then 2021 rolled around. All of a sudden, there were serious reports that Tony Khan had struck a deal with the voice of the voiceless. And when they booked an arena in Chicago on a random day, it seemed like this was real. And incredibly, it was. It resulted in one of the best moments to ever grace pro wrestling. And to be honest with you, I still can't believe it. CM Punk is not only back in a ring, but having matches with the stars of tomorrow. And to top it all off, he seems really happy, which is the most important thing in the world. He also adds a tremendous amount of worth to All Elite Wrestling, and we're only just getting started. I cannot wait to see how this one pans out. Know of any other impossible wrestling returns? Make sure you let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Then head over to whatculture.com, where you can read articles like this with your eyes. Make sure you come follow us on social media, and listen, I tell Oh yeah, I promise. We got a ton of videos here on YouTube. Watch one. And you can even leave the room. Nobody cares. That, of course, is a joke. Please do watch and enjoy. But my name is Simon from What Culture. I love you, but let's go on a date first, and I will talk to you again soon.